recorded. But can we hear if anybody in the, in the Zoom asks something? If anybody in the Zoom asks something, speak up. I will sit here to try to listen to the questions, I guess. Okay, you can also ask in the, in the chat. Okay, so let's talk about the game set. Okay. So what is set? Set is a card game. So we have a deck of cards and the cards contain different drawings. So any card has four attributes. We have the number, the color, the shading, and the shape. And for each of these properties, we have three options. So for instance, for the uh, property color, we have red, purple, and green. So for instance, here we have three empty squiggles, which are purple. Here we have two striped two diamonds, which are green. I'm colorblind, but I, I believe that this is green. <laughs> uh, and basically our deck consists of all possible choices, all possible combinations of these properties. So we have four properties and for every property we have three options. So overall, we have a three to the four, which is 81 cards in the deck. Okay. So how does the game work? Well, we have several players and we have the deck of cards. And at the beginning, we lay 12 cards face up on the table. And the goal of each player is to collect what is known as sets. What is a set? We'll talk about this in two minutes. But... Uh, uh, but basically our goal is to collect sets. Whenever I find a triple of cards, a card which is a set, then I just pick up these three cards and then I replace them with three other cards and uh, we just keep going until there are no more cards left to deal. And the winner is the one of the most sets, okay? <laughs> okay. So our goal is to collect the sets. Our goal is to collect sets. So what are sets? So a set is a set of three cards, which has the following property. For each of the four attributes, so we have color, number, shape, and shading. For each attribute, the, the property of each card has to be either identical or different for all of the cards. So, so for instance, this is a set. Why is this a set? Because for each property, the cards are either all identical or all different. So they're all red, they're all striped, they're all squiggles, and they have a different number. Okay? So next, this is also a set. Why is this a set? For every, so property, name. for every property, everything is different, right? right? They all have different color, different numbers, different shading, and different shapes. Yes. On the contrary, this is not a set. Why is this not a set? Can anyone tell me? Shapes. Okay. Yeah, there are two ovals and one squiggle. So this is not a set because in, in the property, in the uh, attribute of shape, we have two and one. And this is also not a set because, for instance, we have two red cards and one purple card, so this is this doesn't count as a set. Okay, so let's play a game. How many sets are on this board? We're not going to count everything, but uh, uh, can anyone find a set here? Okay, we have yeah. the, 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 the blue diamonds, the blue empty diamond. Yeah. The two. Why do I want to? Why must I do so much? This, 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 in this form a set. The three purple uh, squiggles, the two purple ovals, and the one purple diamond, they form a set because they're all purple. They have different shapes, different shading, and different numbers. So one property is supposed to be the same and all of different. So for each property that you fix, you just check if they're all identical or if they're all different. If one, so we can have two of this and one of this. So you, so the all three of them are purple. Yeah. But they different shape, different shape, and different. Uh, Exactly, that's it. Okay, so we have six sets here. You can keep looking, but believing that there are six sets. Okay, so now that we know a bit more about intuitively what are sets and how they look like, let's talk more about uh, how we uh, can uh, identify them mathematically. So we want to express the idea of being the set in the language of mathematics. So we know that each card is determined uniquely by its 
color, number, shading, and shape. So we can describe it by the four tuple number, color, shading, and shape, right? So what does this make us think about four tuples? Vector spaces, right? Of course, we love vector spaces. So, uh, <laughs> so we can identify the deck with the affine space z3 to the four. Why? Because we have four components, four uh, properties, and for each property, we have three options. So we can just uh, identify each card with a certain point in this affine space. So for instance, if we make this identification, it doesn't matter, it's arbitrary, but under this specific identification, so what is uh, this card? Well, we have three red striped diamonds. So we go to our uh, table and we see that this card corresponds to the point zero, two, one, zero. Or for instance, what is this card? What is the card on the right? FSF, FSF, FSF. Nice. So this is the, the zero point uh, because it, uh, it has three empty green diamonds. Sababa? Good. Okay, so let's keep going. And now that we have identified our deck with the uh, points in the affine space, we want to ask when our points are set. We want to understand what's special about sets. So we know that by the definition of a set, three cards form a set, even only if in each of the four components, they are either, they are either all identical or different. So let's fix a component. What does it tell us about this specific component? So if all of the things are the same, all the things are the same. So if we sum up the component, the, if we sum up this component, then we get uh, something plus something plus something, but they're all the same. So it's three times something. And over Z3, this is zero. And if they're all different from one another, then we have zero plus one plus two, which is zero over Z3. So what's the idea? That three, three points form a set, if and only if their sum is zero. Again, because if they're in each component, they're either all identical or different, and we sum them up, you get zero. Sababa? Wow. Okay. They must have think of the mathematics before they went to the game. Definitely. Okay, so a corollary of this, that any two cards can be completed uniquely into a set. Why? Because when you go back to our affine space, we look at this equation, once we fix A and B, there's only one solution, right? We take C to the other side and we have a solution. So any two cards determine the set uniquely. And remember this property because it's very important for later. Uh, another way we can uh, interpret this property of A plus B plus C equals zero, because we're work working over Z3, we can do some algebraic manipulations and reach this equation. A minus B equals B minus C. What does this tell us? that the points A, B, and C form a set, if and only if they are collinear in Z3 to the four, because this is exactly the equation that determines the line. So for instance, we look, if we look at this two dimensional example, these points form a set because they are one line in Z3 to the four. So now our game is not looking for sets in a deck of cards. We want to look for lines in an affine space. Okay? Okay. So now with this understanding of the game set, let's do some warm up questions, okay? First of all, how many possible sets are in a deck? So what is an equivalent way to ask this with our new language? That's right, how many lines are in the affine space that's three to the four? And we can count this using some linear algebra arguments. Uh, okay, so we know there's a rejection between sets and lines that's three to the four, so we can just count this. So how do we do this? First of all, we count the lines passing through the origin, then we can just move them around to get all the other lines. So how many lines pass through the origin? Well, a line is determined by a non-zero point, right? That this is the direction. Ah, uh, no, eight and two. Hmm? No, eight and two was that uh, So the numbers of lines which pass through the origin is equal to the number of non-zero points. This determines the direction, but there's a problem here because we know that each line is determined by a point, but oh. 
So we know that a, a point, non-zero point determines a line, but the lines in Z3 to the four have three points each. So we have another point here. So we don't just need to count the number of non-zero points, we need to fix. We had we were over counting. So in order, in order to fix this, we need to divide by two because there are two non-zero points here. So overall, what we get, so we count the number of non-zero points and we divide by two. So we have three to the four, this is the deck of cards, minus one, minus the zero point, and we divide by two and we get 40. So this is the number of lines through the origin, but we're not done yet because we want all possible lines. And we know that each line is actually to the four is a line through the origin plus some translation, right? So how, in how many ways can we translate? So naively, we can translate by AD, but... <laughs> so this is a similar argument to before. We can translate by any point on the given line. Okay. So if we have this line, Gilad, to move yeah. chocolate ball. Oh. You'll see. If we have this line, it started in the origin, and we can translate by any of the three points on the line in order to get the same line. So again, we were over counting. We need to divide by three because we have three points. So overall, we get forty, which is the number of lines for the origin, times three to the four, the number of points by which we can translate. And then we divide by three and we get 1,080 possible sets in the deck. Okay, good. So this was the first form of question. Another warm up question we can ask, if we lay six cards on the board, what is the maximum number of sets we can have? So what is this question in our new language? Yeah, if we have six points, what is the maximum number, number of lines we can have in this set, right? So first of all, we know that we can construct uh, uh, a set of six points with three lines as follows. How do we do this? Yeah, so we can choose just three points. I won't draw this. So we want to construct six points with three lines. So we choose three points which are not collinear. Okay, what do we do then? And then we choose additional three points x, y, and z, such that a, b, x is a set, is a line, a, c, y is a line, and b, c, z are all lines. Why can we do this? Why can we do something like this, given a, b, c, which are not collinear? Remember the property from before. Any two points can be uniquely extended into a line, right? So a, b, and x form a line. a, c, form a line with y and bcz form a line with bc form a line with z. And because a, b, and c are not collinear, we don't have any problems. x, y, and z are all distinct and we don't have the same line, okay? So we have found a way to construct a board with six cards and three sets. So can we have more than three sets? Can we have four sets, for instance? Uh, so it would be pretty boring if we could. So it turns out that we can't. Can we, okay, so, all, so can we do any better? It turns out, no. If we have six cards, we can't have more than three sets. So how can we see this? <laughs> so here are some observations we need in order to show this. First of all, note that by, because we can uniquely complete any two points into a line, into a set, then two sets can overlap by at most one point. Why is this? Because if they would overlap by two points, then the third point would have to be the same, right? So this is like the first uh, thing we need to remember. Another thing we need to remember, when we have six cards on the board, each point can be contained in at most two sets. And why is this? So we know by the previous point that two sets can overlap by at most one point. So given this point, we want to form three sets that contain it, possibly. So we need three pairs of points. 
-hmm. These pairs can overlap. Why can't these pairs overlap with each other? Because if they would overlap, what would happen? You would have two sets which overlap by two points, right? The middle and some other point. And this is illegal by the previous part, okay? So overall we have these, we have this point and three disjoint pairs of points, but this is impossible. Why is this impossible? Yeah, we only have six points and now we have seven points. So now we conclude that each point can be contained in its most two sets. So using these observations, we can show that we can't have more than three sets. How can we show this? Well, first of all, we can just start our board with arbitrary two sets, A, B, C, and A, D, E. As soon as our cards are A, B, C, D, E, F, and at the beginning, we have uh, two arbitrary sets. With A, with both the same A. Yeah, by the pigeonhole principle, we must have two sets which contain the same card, right? So assume that we have this, this is the up to symmetry, the only thing we can start with. So now we ask ourselves, which sets can contain B? And to answer this, we look at these two points. Well, first of all, B cannot be in another set with A or C. Why? Because then we'd have sets that overlap by two points. So they can be different from one another. And BDE also can't be a set. Why can't it be a set? Maybe. This is a set and we can't have two oh, sets that overlap by two points. That's right. So the only options we have left are either BEF or BEF. And again, we can't have both options because then again, we have sets which overlap by two points. So we will develop lots of generality. Let's choose BDF to be another set. So after we ask this about B, we ask the same thing about C. Which sets can contain C? And the arguments are the same. First of all, C can't be in another set with A or B because it's already taken. And C, D, E, and C, D, F can't be sets because we already have these sets. So then we'd have something that overlaps by two points, which is impossible. So the only option we have left is C, E, F. So we wanted to have four sets and we got four sets, right? We have A, B, C, A, D, E, B, D, F, and CEF, so we can have four sets, right? No, 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 no. we can't have four sets. No, but no. <laughs> so we know that the only possibility out to symmetry for four sets is ABD, ADE, BDF, and CEF. So why is this impossible? Because recall that any set determines an equation, right? A plus B plus C equals to zero. So we can write down this, write down the system of equations that we get from these four sets. We like to reduce matrices. We can solve the system of equations. For instance, this is the equation a plus b plus c equals to zero. So we can solve the system of equations and then we get the solution a equals to f and b equals to e. What's the problem? Why is this impossible? Yeah, we had six distinct points on our deck. We had six, six distinct cards, but now we see that a equals to f and b equals to e. And so the sets also are not distinct from one another. So we don't really have four sets. So this is a contradiction. This is impossible. And we just conclude that we can't have more than three sets on a board with six cards. Sababa? Okay. Yeah. Anyway, we see that we can have a card with three sets. But we, can't have, we can't have a board with four sets. So we've answered two warm-up questions where we use the, the geometric understanding of the, the Athman subspace. And now we will answer a more interesting question, which is also more applicable when you play the game. The question is, what is the maximum number of cards we can lay on the board when we play set without there being a set? So if anyone here has played set, and I think that some of you did, it must be pretty familiar that you lay like 12 cards on the board and you can't find the set. So you lay three more cards. Maybe we just don't know how to play. Yeah, maybe we're not, not, that, not that good at the game, but we lay more and more cards, 12 cards, 15 cards, 18 cards, and we still can't find a set. And this is really weird. What are, the, what are the odds that there is no set? So it turns out that it's possible not to have a set with 18 cards. So we want to know the maximal number of cards we can have on the deck without there being a set. Or equivalently, we want to know if I have N cards, then I definitely have a set somewhere in here, okay? 
in order for us to make good choices in the game. Okay, so equivalently, we can ask this is what is the maximum number of points in Z3 to the fourth such that no three of them are collinear, right? Because sets are just lined in the affine space. So this is a very well-known problem in affine geometry, which is called the cap set problem. It sounds like a pretty simple question, but it turns out that it, it's an open question. Nobody knows the answer for it. A general deck of sets. For a deck of sets of size, whatever, nobody knows the answer. For our case, we do know the answer. So for general Z3 to the N, the, there is a lower bound of to the N. But for our case of Z3 to the four, we know that the answer is actually 20. The maximum number of cards without a set is actually 20. So here's an example of a board with no sets. And you can look, if you find something, let me know, it will be very embarrassing for me. <laughs> but I think there is no set here. So we want to show that if we have 21 cards or more, we definitely do have a set. If we have 21 points in the admin space, we definitely have a line. So we're actually not going to prove this the, in the four dimensional. Yeah, this is the four dimensional case that three to the four. The proof is a bit technical. So let's prove this three dimensional case, which is a lot nicer. The idea is the same. The proof is basically the same, but there are less equations and I don't like having too many equations. So let's prove the three dimensional case, okay? Uh, okay, so let's start maybe with a, with a baby version, not the three-dimensional case, but the two-dimensional case in order to understand what's going on. So what is the two-dimensional case? We need to fix two of the components, right? So we take all the cards to be green diamonds, and now we have a two-dimensional space, and we want to know what is the maximum number of cards we can have without there being a set. So here is an example of four cards with no sets. It's pretty easy to see that there are no sets here. And I claim that if we have five cards or more, then we definitely do have a set. Okay? Wait, so it's still a set, it's still three cards, right? Yeah, we need to have three cards in a set and... No, no, but you have only two free properties. Mm -hmm. You want that either one of them will be the same, and one of them, the other will be different, or both of them are the same, or both of them... Just as before, we have just two components, but in each component, in each property, I want them all to be either identical or different. Okay? So, in the, for instance, uh, no, no, not the other one. No. So, for instance, maybe if you look at green diamonds, so this is a set. These are green diamonds, and we have three cards, and they have this, the they have different fillings and a different number. So this is an example of a set in the two-dimensional case, okay? So we have a cap set. A cap set is the set of points without a set. We have a cap set of size uh, four, and we want to show that we can't have a cap set of size five. So assume by contradiction that we have a cap set in Z3 to the two consisting of five points. So what's the problem? But we can decompose that three to the two into the disjoint union of three horizontal parallel lines, just like in this drawing. Okay? So, this is uh, one specific example. We assume that we have a cap set of five points. So, for, in, for the drawing, this is the example we chose. And we decompose our space into three parallel lines. Okay? Okay. Now, we see that two lines contain two points. And one line contains one point. So this is what happens in the picture. Why must this happen generally? Why must we... You, you are not allowed to have three at the same. Point. Exactly. We can't have a line with three points because then we'd have a set, which is not what we were assuming. So we must have a division of two and two and one. So we must have one individual point. Let's call it x5. Okay? So the individual point five, x5, is contained in exactly four lines. So this is in the picture, you can see this, but for any general point, we have just four directions, right? We have, this is the space. Okay. Two, two, three, and five. It's not a line. Yeah, so you, found this, you must have a contradiction. But this is a, this is a specific picture, but we're, in every picture we'll have something like this. So each point is contained in four lines, one, two, three, four, and one of them is the horizontal line H. 
extremely annoying. So the individual point is containing exactly four lines. One of them is H. But we know that H doesn't contain any other point in the cap set, right? This is what we have, we have assumed. And other than H, we have three lines. There are four lines, H is taken, we have three lines. But in the cap set, we have four other points other than X5, right? So we have three lines and four points. What's next? By the pigeonhole principle, we must have a line with two points. And this line must also contain the point X5. So we have a line with three points. And this is definitely a set, just like Alon said, in the picture we see, this is the line which contains three points and we must always have it. So in the two dimensional case, we see that we can have a cap set of size five, okay? Okay. So now let's talk about the three dimensional version. We want to show that the maximal cap set is of size nine. So if you want, you can at home pick up a deck of cards and see for yourself that you can make a set of nine cards, which does not contain a set. And we want to show that we can't have 10 cards which don't contain a set. So we can't have 10 points in the affine space, the three dimensional affine space over Z3, without there being a line. So assume by contradiction that there is a cap set C in Z3 to the three, which consists of 10 points. What is the problem? Let's do something which is similar to before. Before we divided it into three parallel lines. So what now we do, we look at the compositions of our space into parallel planes, okay? But three parallel planes. And for every such a composition of Z3 to the three into three parallel planes, H1, H2, and H3, we get a set of three numbers. We call this the hyperplane triple. What is the hyperplane triple? We just count how many cap points in the cap set are in each horizontal, in, in each uh, parallel plane. So, If these are the three parallel planes, we just count how many points in the cap set are in each parallel plane, and this gives us a set of three points. So we consider all possible decompositions, and we count the hyperplane triples. Is the definition of the hyperplane triple okay? Yes. Okay. So we know that for the two-dimensional case, a cap set has at most four points, right? You've already seen this. This means that the only possible values for the hyperplane triples are these 442 and 433. Why? Because the cap set we assume contains 10 points. And in the two dimensional case, a cap set has at most four points. So why are these the only options? Why can't we have anything else? And then every five points on the plane. And then we'll right. That. If we have something which is greater to or greater, equal to or greater than five, then we have five points in a two-dimensional space, and there has to be a set in this contradictor assumption. So these are the only options, the 442 type and the 433 type. So let's denote the number of 442 decompositions by A, and the number of 433 decompositions by B. If we wanted to prove the four-dimensional case that we had, a, we would have a lot more numbers, and now you see why I didn't want to prove this version. But this is a nice version as well. Okay, so we have the numbers A and B, and now we ask ourselves, how many ways are there to decompose Z3 to the three into three hyperplanes? So on one hand, we know that there are only two types of decompositions, right? The 433 and the, and the 442. So the answer is A plus B, because there are only two types, A of the first type, B of the second type, so A plus B. This is the first answer. And now we're gonna do the, the old the combinatorics trick by counting the same thing twice, and we get an equation. So this is the first answer. What is the second answer? Well, instead of counting the decompositions, we know that for any three parallel planes, there is a unique line through the origin, which is perpendicular to them. So we can just count the number of lines with the origin, right? So let's just do the same thing as before. We know that each non-zero point determines a line. And then we have the overcounting argument. So we need to divide. So overall, we have three to the three minus one over two, which is 13. This is exactly the same computation we did before, only for the three-dimensional case, not the four-dimensional case. Okay, so what is the equation that we get? That A plus B equals 13. So this is our first equation. We want to solve it, so we need another equation. So let's what continue. A and B is the number of decompositions of each type. A is the number of four, four, two decompositions, and B is the number of four, three, three decompositions. Okay? Yo. 
So now we need another equation. So we need to count more stuff. So let's count something a bit more complicated. Let's count the number of two marked planes. So what are two marked planes? It's a plane, it's a pair. A plane and two points in the cap set, which are contained in the plane. So for instance, if we have this plane and these three points in the cap set, which intersected, then the number of two marked planes is three. We have this, we have this, and we have this, okay? So let's count these and see what we get, what, what equations we get. So first of all, we know that for any pair of points, there are exactly four planes which contain them. You can check this, we will over z3 to the three, so this is just the linear algebra exercise. We're gonna use this in a minute. So this means that there are four times 10 choose two, two marked planes. Why is this? First of all, we need to choose two points for the two marked plane, right? So we choose two points out of 10. So this is this part. The second part is four because any two points are contained in four points. So we get four times 10 to the two, 10 choose two, which is 180 marked, two marked planes. Wait, 10 choose two because we assume that we want to each uh, two marked plane contains, it, it comprises of two points and a plane that contains them. So we need to choose two points two points in the cap set and a plane which contains them. We know that for any two points in the cap set that we pick, there are four planes which contain them. This is the, the exercise here. So we first count the number of pairs of points. For each pair of points, we give four planes and this gives this result, okay? Good. So this is the first answer, but we want an equation. So when we want another answer, so we can count this using our, uh, uh, a and B divisions, the 442 type division and the 433 type divisions. We can just check each individual case. So in the case of 442 hyperplanes, the op number of uh, two marked planes is four choose two plus four choose two plus two choose two. Why? We have three planes. One contains four points, the other contains four points, the other contains two points. And we need to choose two from each one, right? One, two marked planes. So this is exactly it. We choose two points from this plane, we choose two points from this plane, and two points from this plane, a plane, and we get 13 two marked planes for this division, the 442 type, type A. What about type B, the 433? We have the same thing. Four choose two, three choose two, three choose two, which is 12. And for these, how many options do we have? How many such divisions are there? A. How many divisions of this type are there? B. So what equation do we get? We get that 13 times A plus 12 times B equals 180, okay? So now we have another equation and we have a previous equation, A plus B equals 13 and we can solve this, even I can solve this. <laughs> and we get that A equals to 24 and B equals to minus 11. So what's the problem? Oh, God, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> so we're trying to count things and we expect to have a natural number as an answer. And so this is the contradiction. We have assumed that we have a cap set of 10 points. We've done the computation. We see that we have a contradiction. So this proves the three-dimensional case of why we can't have a cap set which is too big. So now let's talk about the, the real life set game of the four-dimensional case, what we need to change in order to prove the result that if we have 21 cards, 21 points, then we definitely have a set or a line. So what's different in this case? First of all, we've already seen that there is a cap set with 20 cards. I've laid it on the board and hopefully nobody has found a set. So we want to show that we can't have 21 cards. So assume a contradiction that we have a cap set of size 21 and let's do the same thing as before. We look at all possible decompositions of Z3 to the four into three hydroplanes, just as before, just in the two-dimensional case and the three-dimensional case, okay? So what do we do now? We want to get equations, and from the equation, we want to get a contradiction. So first of all, uh, we count the number of such decompositions into three hydroplanes. Then we count the number of two marked hydroplanes, just as before, this gives us two equations. Then furthermore, we count the number of three marked hydroplanes, which is absolutely terrible, and this is why we're not doing it, but the idea, as you see, is exactly the same. 
And then we get a system of three equations and seven variables, which naively is not <laughs> enough, but because we want our solutions to be uh, natural numbers, we can show from this uh, system of equations already that there is no solution of the natural numbers and we win because we get that we can't have a cap set of size 21. Okay, so the next time that you play set and we have uh, 21 cards, know that there is a set there and you're just being lazy me to <laughs> Okay? <laughs> okay. Okay. Wait, I have a question. Yeah, alone. So you said in the Z square it was uh, four, yes, yeah. and then nine, then 20. So I see some pattern here. Uh, in the in Z square, you had a plane uh, divided into lines. The maximum in each line is two. Mm -hmm. So it's two plus two plus zero. It's four. Then Z to the three, it was nine. So it's four in each place. So it's four, four plus one, it's nine. Then 20, it's nine plus nine plus two, so 20. Mm -hmm. So I have a question, Z to the five. Is this 53? Because if it's 53, there is a pattern. I, see. I don't remember about Z to the 5, but three. you can look at it. There's a table, I think, in the in the blog of Terence Stout, there's a nice post about the capsule problem. And we give like the first, I don't know, 10 numbers, which were uh, checked with a computer or something. No, but they would sure not and there is no. Something <laughs> you can see that the. It's it's like, so, it's you like the it's, so you say it's in Bemington. Yeah, it's in, it's in Bemington. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like the number of. Uh, uh, smooth, uh, smooth structures on uh, on SN. It's a uh, it's a whole big mess. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so there is no pattern here, and this is basically an open question. But for this, we can actually prove something. We don't need to check for a computer. Okay. So we've done uh, like a nice property of the game. So let's now talk about something which is a bit more general called supersets. Okay. So what is a superset? How do we define it? So a superset is a collection of cards S such that for any two cards A and B, there is a unique card C in S, which completes them into a set. Okay, so a superset is basically a collection of cards which is closed undertaking sets. This is the intuition, okay? So once we have defined this, we can ask some pretty natural questions. First of all, what are possible sizes for supersets? Or how many possible si supersets are there of each size? Do we have any restrictions? So you'll see that once we formulate this again, in linear algebra, we have a pretty simple answer. <laughs> so first of all, what is a superset in our language? We know that supersets are collections of points which are closed undertaking lines, right? Closed undertaking sets. So how do we call in Hebrew or English uh, subsets of a affine space which are closed undertaking lines? Subspaces, right? We're looking for affine subspaces of Z3 to the 4. And these are exactly the supersets. We want that for each two points, the line which contains a point to be contained in the space. So this is exactly an affine subspace. So now we just want to count affine subspace. And this is a bit easier, similar to what we did before. So let's do it. First of all, what are the possible sizes of affine subspaces of a finite vector space? It's just the divisors, right? So our affine subspace is uh, of size 81. So our options are 1, 3, 9, 27, and 81. OK, so that, now let's count the affine subspaces of each size, OK? So for 1 and 81, this is not very interesting, right? We don't have too many uh, worries. For size 3, I claim that we already did this. We already solved this. What is a size 3 superset? It's a line, it's set, it's just a set. So how many sets are there? 1080 and we have the answer already. So we just need to look at, at nine and 27. So let's do the nine version, which is nice and not do the 27 version, which is a bit, I mean, the computation is the same, it's just bigger numbers, okay? So let's do the nine version. So how many, basically we're asking how many two dimensional planes are there in the F on the south space, right? This is a subspace of size nine. So first of all, we count, just as before, the number of planes which pass through the origin, and then we translate. Okay, so how many planes are there from the origin? We need two basis vectors, okay? Uh, and then we need to mod out by GL2 of Z3. Why? This is the same as before, just two-dimensional. So <laughs> So to form 
a plane, I need two basis vectors, which give me a plane, but there are more than these choices, right? We can make this choice, this choice, anything which can be carried by the action of GL2 of Z3, we can take all any two bases from one to the other. So we, so we overcount. These are all the same planes. So this is what you need to model by the action of the uh, GL2 of Z3. So we have 80 times 78, which is the number of options to get two linearly independent vectors, right? We get, a, we pick a, a non-zero point, 80. We pick a point which is not on the same line as the other point, 78. And then we divide by 48. This is the size of the, or group. So we get 130 options for planes which pass through the origin. Now what do we need to do to get all possible planes? We just need to shift, right? So what is a shift? Well, it's just an element of the quotient space, right? Z3 to the four mod Z3 to the two. We need to add something from the outside, which gives us another plane. So the size of this is nine, right? We have 81 divided by nine. So overall we have 130 times nine options, which is 1,170 options for two dimensional planes. So this is a number of supersets of size nine. Sababa. And for the 27 version, you can do the same computation. And uh, when, uh, uh, this, this is a, a homework exercise. We get these are 120 hyperplanes. Basically, our question was just counting affine subspace. OK? So now we uh, have answered another question about the game set or about generalization of set. And now let's do something a bit more uh, generalized. By the way, so can. I predict for Z to the fifth, I predict that for 43, like 20 plus 20 plus 3, mm -hmm. and I check, and it's 45. <laughs> so in physics, you would say that I have found an approximation. You have an error. I have an approximation. approximation. Up to first order, you were correct. <laughs> but in second order, you have failed. Oh. So we've spoken about sets in affine geometry, right? Looking for lines in an affine space, but we don't have to restrict ourselves to affine spaces, right? We can look at all sorts of geometries. We're just looking for lines. So this gives us a lot more of ways to generalize sets. So let's talk instead of affine geometry, let's talk about projective geometry for a moment. You don't need to know too much about it, just, just a bit, okay? So. Let's consider another version of set, but instead of working over Z3 to the four, the affine space working over the projective space. Let's work in the uh, a set where the cards represent the points in the two dimensional projective space over Z2. This is just a very simple projective space. This is the projective space. It has seven points and seven lines. So our deck has seven cards and seven sets, okay? But again, our goal would be just to Look for lines. We define that three cards from a set if and only if a plus b plus c equals zero, or if they are all on the same line. This is another card game. So how would our deck look like? So our deck would have seven cards, right? We have seven points. And what is the rule for when is something a set? Three cards from a set. If the numbers of the number of shapes of each type in them is even. Okay, this is the same criterion as being on the same line here. Okay, so for instance, this is a set. Why is this a set? Because for each shape, there is an even number. This is even, and this is even. This is not a set because we have two of those guys, two of those guys, one of these guys. This is not even. So in the projective space, this is not a line. So this is like a, another version of set that we can play if we want to make an expansion of the game. <laughs> there are actually in eBay uh, sets like this which you can purchase. I'm not uh, advertising anything, <laughs> but if you want to play, purchase for the time. <laughs> okay, so we we have affine set, we have projective set, and we can ask what are the other sets we can have. So let's make the definition of a set game even more abstract. Okay, so let's define the notion of an abstract set game now. So first of all, we define something called as a Steiner triple system. What is a Steiner triple system? It's a finite set X 
together with a family S of subsets of size three. So we can think of X as the deck of cards and the family S as the family of sets, okay? What is the rule for the family S? That for any X, Y, and X, there is a unique Z in X which contain, which completes them into a set. This is exactly as we had before, right? For any two points, there is a unique line which completes them into a set. So this is the Steiner triple system. We can think of it as a deck of cards and a family of sets, but we will demand something which is a bit stronger than that. So given a Steiner triple system, let's look at the automorphism group of the Steiner triple system, okay? This is just the associated symmetry group. So the group of permutations on X, which preserve the Steiner triple system structure. So it needs to send sets into other sets, right? So for instance, if we think about the uh, elements of GL to Z3, these are automorphisms, right? We call GL4 Z3. Why is this? These are transformations, permutations on the F line space, which send lines to lines, right? Linear transformations send lines to lines. So these are, for example, automorphisms of our Steiner triple system, which is our game of cell, okay? For the projective space, you can do the same thing. You can uh, uh, think of the transformation that moves sets to sets, okay? So this is the automorphism group. And now we can define an abstract set game as a Steiner triple system with a symmetry group, which is two transitive. What does two transitivity mean? Exactly what we want is given any pair x, y, and another pair, pair W, Z, there is an automorphism in our symmetry group which sends X, Y to W, Z. So in a sense, this property means that all lines are equivalent to one another. Our deck is homogeneous. We can send lines from one to the other. So we define an abstract set game to be any Steiner triple system such that the automorphism group is too transitive. Does this make sense in terms of intuition? It's like that is, uh, yeah, it, it, it's similar because yeah, we want to take some points to points. We want to take circles to circles. We want to take lines to lines. This is very similar. So this is how we define an abstract set game. And now we can ask how many abstract set games are there? We have the projective type. We have the affine type. So how many other types are there under this definition? So. This is the cool part. <laughs> this is a theorem for the 80s. I think it's extremely cool, which st states that the only abstract set games are exactly the ones we already saw, the affine set game over Z3 and the projective set games over Z2. So in the paper, they don't call it an abstract set game. They call it Steiner triple, Steiner triple systems with two transitive symmetry groups. But <laughs> the idea is the same. There are only two types of set games and we've already seen them, okay? Oh. So do you, want, do you want me to prove this? <laughs> so we're not gonna prove this. The proof, the proof uses the classification theorem for finite simple groups. So naturally we're, we're not gonna prove this. If you want to read the paper, then uh, talk to me, I'll send you the paper. I, I didn't read it because it seems like a mess, but I think that the result is pretty cool. You have only two types of abstract set games. There are only two ways to, find the lines in the, our geometries, okay? So any questions about this? Any questions? Yeah, really. So when you're looking at sets of lines or sets of hyperplanes, uh, well, if you're familiar with the grass plugin? Oh, the one. Yeah, so it's, it's yeah. like trying to find the number or possible ways to find K-dimensional yeah. subspaces mm -hmm. or B. Uh, so, but usually this is like vector spaces, mm -hmm. right? So it's basically <laughs> just like the projective space, but different uh -huh. dimensions. But this is like on sort of cubes, right? Because you, you, you have, have a finite three, three, right? Yeah. And like lines are like, if you make the cube periodic and you have planes that sort of go, go points. So if I understand you correctly, you want to move not at uh, lines, but at say it's planes. You want to move planes from one You want a Steiner triple system where the sets are planes and not lines. So I can only draw two dimensions, but uh, so this would be a bit. Uh, you know, what I mean is that you, you have a lot of, there's a lot of results and 
some interesting things that you said about grass onions, but uh -huh. is there sort of a similar theory of, of grass onions on cubes instead of being in this is, I think, uh, yeah, this is a good question. I actually don't know much about grass in finite space. It's actually, I mean, I don't even sure. I mean, what is the structure you need to do? So I have no clue. <laughs> uh, that, that's an interesting question. But I think that if you're working over Z3, then in a sense that what the theorem said that if you find the uh, a standard triple system which describes the Grassmannian and the sets are the, I don't know, the k dimensional subspaces, then you can reduce this to the case of lines for a, another dimension. I think this is what this means, but then uh, no clue. <laughs> Any other questions? Stefan, stop. Uh, 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 okay. yeah, so, so, are there any questions generally? <laughs> Where you can extend any three points into four points? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is like a Steiner four system. Yes, yeah, so I guess you can, uh, I don't know of anything of this type, but you can look for the. Because you had triplets and Z3 was a dominant. Uh, yeah. object mm -hmm. in this theory, so. So maybe you can do, yeah, maybe you can do something similar if you don't want to have Steiner triple systems, but Steiner four systems, that any three points can be extended uniquely into something. Uh, so yeah, if you look into the classification theory for <laughs> <laughs> you, you, know, you, might be, you might be able to prove something like that. I know absolutely nothing about this. <laughs> so are there any other questions? Salama, so thank you. If anybody wants to play set? Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us for this water seminar. I hope that there will be a lot more seminars which will be hybrid or maybe even in class soon, hopefully if the Hanchayot go down. Thanks everyone.